Hey, Steeler Nation. Welcome to your SteelerNation.com podcast, sponsored by Total Sports Enterprises. Now part of the DK Pittsburgh Sports Podcast Network. I'm your host, G Stryker, and with me today is the Pittsburgh's famous writer, podcaster, funny man, Dave Demashek. Dave, how you doing, my friend? Well, now I'm nervous. Now you built me up too much. <laughs> Take it back. That's Just what we do schmuck. here. We got to build up from Wilkinsburg who went to, uh, who was uh, down Churchill way played his little league there. Let's let's just go from there and set <laughs> expectations nice and low. <laughs> well, I can't set them low. You do have two great podcasts out with the extra points podcast, the minus 3 podcast. Uh I, I mean, how do you have any time to yourself, really? Well, listen, I I I decided long ago around about the turn of the millennium, I decided like what is is having a conversation worth it if it's not being recorded? And uh, that's really been my guiding light for these uh, these last 21 years now. Perfect. And I want to know personally, uh, do you travel on game days? What's a normal game day like for you? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, on the contrary, I tend to, I would say, three quarters of the regular season, at least, you'll find me on a Sunday seated on my couch. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, just... You know, just to kind of set the mood, sometimes I will literally draw the shades because I'm in Southern California after all. We don't want the sunshine coming in here. I need I, I need steel gray, at least spiritually, to watch the deeds going down in Heinz Field. And uh, and then I'll keep an eye on the rest of things. But yeah, no, I'm looking forward to, among some other um, going on the road games, I'm going to go into the new fancy stadium here in Los Angeles to watch the Steelers. Oh take on the chargers in whatever, several, I forget how many weeks away that is, but yeah, generally I, I like to focus. I feel coach Tomlin and the fellas work so hard all week. The least I can do is give them my undivided attention. There you go. And you might have to leave the blinds open because it looks like the Steelers game is going to be bright and shiny and sunny weather for this upcoming week. Uh, just to make it feel like you're in a little bit of the Berg or at least bring in a little bit of California over to the Berg for this game, which I'm going to be at. I'm excited for it. Oh, nice. I'm jealous as all get out. Believe me, <laughs> oh. if I had a choice, yeah, I say I'm sitting on my couch. If I had a choice, if I were within five states of the banks of the three rivers, you would find me there at least eight times uh, <laughs> nice. in the regular season. But yeah. as it stands, yes, I, I, I'm I'm jealous of you. Good for you. Well, let me know if you ever need a ticket. I Sometimes I've got a spot right next to myself that can get filled by you. So um, loved having you on the draft podcast. It was our first full coverage of the Steeler Nation draft pod draft podcast coverage, which we did the entire draft. You were day two with us, and we had a great time with you and Kendall Simmons coming in and out. And I knew it was crazy, but I'm finally glad to get you one-on-one -on -one and, and be able to talk because – I mean, you're always entertaining. You're always fun. You're very knowledgeable on the Steelers. So that's it's nice to have more of an intimate setting now today for you and me. Let's let's get to know each other. Let's let's, let's really dig in here. <laughs> so we had our first game, and I missed all the games last year, obviously, with 2020. There was barely any um fans in the stands for the most part across the league, especially up in the north. But how about that game in Buffalo last week, Dave? I mean, you got hostile territory. The crowds are back at full capacity. What did that feel like for you, you know, finally getting to see a game with full capacity stands again? Yeah, I, I, I thought it might be more of an advantage than it was for the home teams. I mean, mm -hmm. it kind of mixed results as far as that goes. I really thought that the Steelers were walking into a really tough spot. That's yeah. week one. Up there, you know, people always lament, especially if you're south of, on the southern side of um, the Mason-Dixon line. Oh, no, it's December and we have to go up to Buffalo and all of that. But it <laughs> yeah. ain't exactly a great spot in week one after a year away from the stadium. As yeah. rabid as that fan base is. I love that fan base. Yeah, uh, outside great fan of, base. Outside of the Steelers, there's no yeah. fan base I'd like to see lift the Lombardi more yeah. than the Bills. Yeah. Um, I don't know if the fans get to lift it, but anyway, they would live vicariously <laughs> through Josh exactly. Allen. Exactly. Yes. But I, I, you, 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 you follow my point. Yeah. Um, I thought that for them to go in there and win that game was big. Now I understand that the specifics of the 60 minutes aren't really transferable, at least in part, the idea that you're getting 
points off your special teams. That's not something that obviously you're going to be looking to to get on a weekly basis. Those are nice extra extra. Those are bonus points, if you will, to right. get. But I but you know the thing that is, and I know a lot of people are talking about it. And I'm a vain guy, so I have to pat myself on the back for for saying this. All off season, really, even since January, I've been saying the Steelers are going to lose Bud Dupree, mm. and the answer is Melvin Ingram. And if mm. you could land Melvin Ingram to mix in there with with High Smith, now you'd really be talking about a nice rotation. And so it's yeah. come to pass. And the early returns are great. The only issue with Ingram is his health. But if you go back and look, you you don't have to look up team defense statistics with the Chargers, just use your eyeball. When Melvin Ingram was out there with the Chargers, it gets to another level. He is a yeah. difference maker. He requires attention from the O-line and, and the, the pass protecting RB and all of that. The defense is good. Um, I also think glass half full, and I appreciate, by the way, your ongoing uh, optimism. I know it's it's much easier in our cynical 21st century to to poop on the local team and to just yeah. declare, boy, this team's done. This team has no chance. And the reason that that's a smart play, if you're talking into a microphone, is mm. the chances are you're going to be right at the end of it because they only give out the one Lombardi at the end of the year. So you can pat yourself on the back like, told you I was right. So right. I appreciate your optimism there. But here's some <laughs> optimism for you. If they can just make their way to about week six, week eight, you know, getting mm. to the midway point in the season. I think that offensive line maybe isn't among the top 10 in the league, but it becomes a relative position of strength versus what it's been for the last year and a half now. Yeah. And if we can just get, if the defense can just get us to that point, and if seven can keep getting mm. in the ball into the hands of a really diverse group of playmakers, think about from Friar Muth, uh, Friar Muth and Najee to the existing yeah. weapons, Juju and Chase Claypool and Deontay Johnson are three very different kinds of guys right? with or without the ball in their hands or in a different kind of provide different danger to defenses. If we can just get to the point where that offensive line is, is comfortable with the NFL speed. I mean, I really think with that defense that this team is, you know, I I've been saying all summer too. I, I like the way this ro roster shapes up against the Ravens. And that's really, I know yep. the Browns are great and everything to me, mm -hmm. it still remains if you finish ahead of the the Ravens mm. in the AFC North, then at least you're very likely into the tournament in January. And, you know, you're so vain. You probably think this podcast is about you, Dave. You're so vain. No, that's great. I, I, <laughs> and, I'm so vain. So I wish vain. every podcast was about me. I'm so vain. You're so I'm so vain. vain. <laughs> but insane that the Steelers haven't had a home opener since 2014, seven years now going. You discussed, Crazy. yeah, absolutely insane. And you started touching on the point that I wanted to hit on next. And that is to get to that point, to get to that midway part of the season is to be expecting improvement out of the team as it goes on from week to week. And we have to expect it because we've got six rookies that are contributing. I mean, it's, it's normally, it's a positive draft. If you get two to three starters out of a draft, we already have six that just from this past draft, which is a record for Steelers and you know, other than their inaugural season, obviously uh, starting rookies, but you know, this is just really everybody on the roster. Um, you know, we, we talked about the offensive line, Friar Muth. We talked about Kendrick Green at center, you know, more at left tackle, more set in because banners hurt obviously, but still doing a good job. Najee Harris, of course, a running back. We had Trey Norwood, the, the the lower draft picks here in the sixth, seventh round. Both of our seventh rounders are starters now. Him coming in to be the uh, the slot guy, getting the majority of the slot snaps, and also the new punter Presley Harvin the third. But what I want to see is improvement from game to game, especially when you have such a young team. But what I saw even last week was improvement from quarter to quarter. And that is something that was really important, especially going on the road with those four rookie offensive players on that line. You're not getting pre-snap penalties. You know, Tomlin just mentioned that in his presser on Tuesday, and that's really important. That's something that you'd expect to see out of a rookie offensive line, Dotson being a first-year starter as well. No, no pre-snap penalties from the offensive line. They held their own. They did pretty well. And by the way, don't uh, don't be naive. I think Coach T was uh, doing a little passive aggressive shot at one Alex Leatherwood, who had <laughs> all the penalties 
on Monday night. And <laughs> yeah. now he has to handle that uh, Steelers oh. pass rush. I think he's probably <laughs> trying to get into the kid's head a little bit. Ooh. I'm, sure, I'm sure Derek Carr is sweating that. I mean, legitimately yeah. sweating that himself. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I hear you. Uh, just a, a little, uh, a little note. I would mm-hmm. not be surprised if Zach Banner, when he comes back, mm-hmm. if Chooks don't get it right between now and then, if you see Banner on the right side and they leave Dan Moore um, on the left, there, yeah, on the left. I, I, would, I that agree with you, a stunner. But listen, yeah, uh, more bodies that are competent, uh, the better. As you can see, the Ravens are are already a week in now and are, are just decimated and they're going to be scrambling and have Al Villanueva as their answer. So yeah. I, you know, relatively speaking again, in the horse race, that is the perennial horse race in the AFC North. Yeah. I like where the Steelers are positioned better than where the Ravens are. And uh, yeah, yeah, I hear you. Let's uh, but I, I do think in broad strokes, every NFL season tends to go this way. They mm-hmm. offense wins the first half of the year. And then the defense, the coordinators in the league get enough tape on what these offenses are trying to do. And they more or less can kind of figure it out and figure a way to slow it down. So that's kind of inverted for the Steelers. And it's curious. I'm curious to see how that plays out because the defense is the position of strength, obviously, right now. Um, And if that's, you know, if that becomes uh, even stronger and the offense kind of rises up, you know, the AFC is so loaded. Let's not. Just yeah. like I said all last year, this isn't 2020, um, uh, 2020 hindsight for me. I was saying it every step of the way last year when they were, you know, 4-0, and 8-0, 11-0, into the playoffs, the victory over the Colts and all of that. Yeah. Um, really, with what was happening last year in society, I really was big on journey over destination everybody this is enjoyable if every isn't this nice we didn't even know if we were going to have football we didn't know if roethlisberger was going to be back or we'd be out in the great abyss of searching for a qb instead we had a team ruling the nfl or the at least its own division Mm -hmm. for a long stretch there that's my goal again this year in a conference that has the browns looking like the brown i don't know if you heard about bake i mean like that that's the team this year this we should all pat them on the back right now congratulations <laughs> start the parade plans and everything else because this is their year we're just this is their world and we're living in it but right uh, not that um, i haven't heard that before out of browns fans and no, national no, no, no. media do about it, the browns do it or you're a hater right now, do that but also you have i mean for real you have the chiefs you have the bills yeah. the yeah. chargers are really good belichick's right. team looks like it's gonna be okay yeah i mean you know the Super Bowl, it's going to be very difficult for any of the teams I just named, and that mm-hmm. includes the Pittsburgh Steelers. In the meantime, let's enjoy this. This is already off to a little bit better start than what we heard it was going to be for the last eight months. I'm, I, I, I'm here for it, as the kids say. You know, I want to go back at least to your point of get, actually getting Mark Ingram on the team and him coming from the Chargers system. And I can really get into nitty gritty stuff with you, which is what I love. And since he played in the Chargers system and we're playing Las Vegas this week, Las Vegas has a lot of the coaches from the Chargers defense of the previous year. So do you think he will be able to help out the Steelers offense to know kind of like what kind of scheming because um Tomlin even mentioned it in the press conference he said they yeah, have their defensive line coach their linebackers coach are all coming over from the Chargers uh so you know I, I might be as apt to look at Chargers game film from 2020 as opposed to you know the the, the uh, Raiders game film from this year or from mm-hmm. last year so do you think that could be some kind of small advantage that maybe he can kind of tell the Steelers offense what to expect out of this type of offense, this type of defense, other than what they can already see on film, it makes sense what you say. And mm-hmm. Gus Bradley obviously was in was uh, down there with the Chargers when Ingram right. was there. Mm-hmm. I, in fact, I was in the stands with Gus Brad. Well, he was on the field, and I was in the stands when <laughs> Duck Hodges went in there and beat his Chargers <laughs> defense. Yeah, um, that makes sense to me. And it was really one of my favorite questions for a number of years, asking mm-hmm. pro football players when you hear like. They just this team just signed that guy from the other team who they're about to play. Yeah. And how much can you glean from what that guy knows? And some guys say, like, there's nothing, that's nothing. And other guys say, 
Oh, of course. I mean, of course, they. <laughs> you can get indicators of what they want to do. Yeah. I'm inclined to go with the with the latter group on that, mm -hmm. that surely it matters. It's the same reason why you see so much nepotism or, or, or otherwise in the league. It's a people, you know, human beings go with what they know. So are we to imagine that Gus Bradley thinks com completely differently than he did two years ago about how to approach things? Obviously, he's right. playing to the specific pieces he has. As far as that goes, though, I do think that they're they're big on unleashing the hounds. You saw that yeah. against the Ravens. They really want to get after the QB. Okay, do that, but that comes at a price. I think that if you were overly optimistic about what Najee Harris was going to do in Week One, I think you're going to see something closer to what uh, to what he's going to be this week against the Raiders. I think they'll yeah. they'll try to get after seven, but they're going to have a hard time also shutting down twenty two. Who, by the way, I keep saying it. This was one that I'm really disappointed he didn't listen to me on. He should have really been number thirty two and had on his back Harris and made it <laughs> Harris Junior. And then, or or about the Franco Junior, or just the Harris thirty two in the black and gold would have been the coolest. Why didn't he it do that? Th that? Then you could have worn your own block number jersey and had the Harris on there. I mean, what a gift that would have been to the old Steelers fans! Like Dave, Dave, I, right. I put this on the shelf when Frank I put on that uh, that blue and green Seahawks jersey. I ain't worn this thing since nineteen eighty three, but now it's out of the closet. Now I'm gonna wear it for Najee. For Franco Jr., they should have done that, really. It would have been great. So the Steelers now, too, uh, they're putting together quite a streak, and that is the sacks per game streak. I think they're up to 70-some games, 71, 72 straight regular season games with a sack, and they just passed, uh, you know, right at the end of the season, they passed the old Tampa Bay team that won the Super Bowl where Tomlin was also a part of that team. Mm -hmm. So – you know, we like to think that, yeah, maybe Tomlin is a part of, for, for both franchises, maybe he learned how to get after the quarterback, how to pressure in different ways from the Tampa Bay organization, carried it over. Um, how much of that could you see as being part of Tomlin's prior experience? And also, I know a lot of Steeler Nation has, has been talking about and has heard that Tomlin may be the one calling the plays now. It, it's, it's, we got this rumbling about last year where it started to become the case and at the end of 2019 as well uh, between he and Butler. Do you know anything to these rumors that we hear along Steeler Nation lines? Is there any merit to that at all? I don't know anything about that, honestly. Okay. Um, but uh, I do know that Tomlin takes specific pride, and you mentioned his Buccaneers days, mm -hmm. specific pride in the secondary. That is... Yeah. That is his mm -hmm. realm. Uh, that's his specific area of expertise mm -hmm. that he really leans into. So um, whatever you like about the the back end there, whatever you don't like about it, I think you can put that more squarely on Tomlin than on yeah. Butler or otherwise. Nice. So one other thing, I just want to make a quick point about our great general manager here in Kevin Colbert. And uh, we talked about the draft this year with six uh, starters already out of the nine picks. Everybody's still in the league. I think uh, two are on practice squads. One's still on ours. One's away at a different one. Um, but, I mean, just uh, actually, I think everybody is on. Yeah, Quincy Roche is the only one that's not on our practice squad. Everyone else is rostered. Hmm. Buddy, Because Buddy Johnson's rostered and Loudermilk is rostered. Loudermilk was inactive, of course, last game. But both rostered. But you have to go back to 2000 and since 2017 draft, I think there's only three players that he has drafted since 2017 that aren't in the league anymore. Hmm. So that's pretty impressive. Well, and also if you kind of look at, to me, the, I, I, you could apply this to sort of how the Patriots have done things in the mm -hmm. 21st century and their other successful teams. But one common feature with most teams that have enduring success, which is to say beyond even just a single season, the way the NFL works, some teams can really rise up, have a, uh, have a magical season, then drop right back down. But yeah. the Seahawks were an enduring brand there for a bit. And obviously are still in the, mm -hmm. are, are, are still relevant here. Yeah. Um, a big part of that was hitting on late round and free yes. agent pickups and and some of those working out. You need a few of those things to happen to really have a a, a complete roster. And hmm. you know, James Pierre um, 
you know, jumps out as a, as a potential in that yeah. regard. I mean, Cam Sutton was a third round pick who mm-hmm. wasn't getting a ton of run in his first couple few years and is now really a Swiss army knife for that right. secondary. It's really, it does appear that Tomlin and Colbert and, and the rest sort of, mm-hmm. it, it feels like if you look at what they've done in the last year or two, it really feels like what they want is versatility in their mm-hmm. players. They like yes. guys who can, who can move from this spot to that and can play it different ways. And that's really everything in the 21st century. It feels like to me or, or, or uh, uh, an important thing. And I think um, in 2021 specifically, I think Colbert, I mean, uh, it depends on what the, the team that they actually field every Sunday yeah. uh, does in terms of record. But if this is a successful team as in a playoff team, I, I think you're gonna be hard pressed to, come up with a better name for um, for a better executive than Kevin Colbert this year. I mean, he right. he went out and got I mean, like Dwayne Haskins was was a punchline when they right. grabbed him. And yeah. now he's on the roster. I mean, yeah. it, it was it was up until, you know, mid August where that was in question, whether mm-hmm. or not he was even going to make the roster. But they took a flyer on him. Yeah, that appears to at least for now have worked sufficiently that we got to hold on to him for another year and see where he is. Mm. you know, next August. Um, and you know, th- this old thing about this thing about like, Oh, the Steelers have to get over themselves and the way they do business. Mm. You know, you saw that happen with TJ Watts deal, but also grab a Minka attention. Fitzpatrick as well. That was a F- Minka Fitzpatrick, yeah. Vance yeah. McDonald, yeah. Joe Hayden, uh, like three minutes before the season kicked off a few years ago. And the difference <laughs> as Joe Schobert, um, right. Who am I forgetting now? There's somebody uh, the, else on the run. Uh, yeah, that, that one guy. You might you might have actually said a preseason. Uh, it, it, it told everybody before oh, we picked him up. <laughs> number eight. Yeah. Yeah. Ingram. Number yeah. eight. I love the eight. And also uh, eight. going out and and trading within the division to pick up Chris Wormley, which yeah. is something that we've never done, other than getting rid of our old receivers to Cleveland because we know they're not going to do anything. I do um, think that that's a big thing. That like the the Raven Steelers rivalry is great um, because they are mirror images of them right. uh, of each other and the way yeah. they kind of approach things and the vibe off the two teams and everything. Yeah. Um, obviously Ben Roethlisberger and Lamar Jackson are quite, uh, quite different in the sure. way they uh, play the position. But generally speaking, you, you, you're picking up what I'm laying down. Yeah. And I think that there's been a, a, a turn that a lot of people have not observed. And that's why I had the Steelers ahead of the Ravens this year Mm -hmm. could be questions about the youth that the Steelers are playing on the offensive line. But Mm -hmm. I think for the first time in a half decade, maybe there's more depth and quality on both uh, sides of the line of scrimmage in Pittsburgh than there have been in in Baltimore. You could tell that Ozzie and DaCosta focus on that all the time. They're always looking and they, the funny thing, about the Steelers Ravens rivalry is it, 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 the the paradox that they both look for the same things in yeah. players. I uh, and one side hits almost always on high end wide receivers whenever right. they take them. They could yep. draft them. They could draft them in the sixth round. It's still going to work <laughs> out. And the uh, and cannot figure out how to draft draft a uh, cornerback. A corner. <laughs> And the Ravens are the exact opposite. The yep. exact opposite of that. Okay, <laughs> so, we, we, so can that out, we, we know who can cover people. We don't know who can catch it in that <laughs> in that equation. Well, we we should team a, up. We'll be a super team. Exactly. But but here's my theory on that. And you've just touched on that earlier when we talked about Tomlin being that secondary guru, you know, being the huge winning the Super Bowl with Tampa Bay, knowing secondary, that's his thing. That's what he takes pride in. Yet we can't draft a cornerback. Yet, he played wide receiver at William & Mary. Maybe there's something more to knowing about playing the position you played in college, factoring into being able to draft wide receivers. I don't know. It's just complete it's speculation Ted, on my part. Or is part. it the Ted Williams thing? Ted Williams <laughs> was good at hitting a baseball himself and <laughs> therefore was bad at teaching other people how to <laughs> hit a baseball. Like, He's just, just doing it the way I'm doing. Dude, just, just, like, look when I swing it, like it, it, it lands or it goes over the fence. Like that's <laughs> what, what, what do you guys not, why don't you do like me? Like a co- coach, we, you know, maybe it's that, I don't know. It is it, that adds yeah. to the mystery. You're right. And one thing I wanted to pick up to on when you were talking about that too, Dave, the way that we picked up people like Wormley, who's now has to be a big part of the defense since two, it's out, uh, picking up Schobert, picking up, um, Ingram as well. But the, the crazy thing is when a team is usually making those moves in the off season, you know, 
going out pick, tr giving a trading and giving up a draft pick for a guy that is a pro bowler in the middle of the field, going out and picking up another pro bowler who's an outside linebacker. And those are usually end up having to be the pieces that that team needs to be successful the next year. The interesting aspect in this situation is they brought these guys in to essentially just be guys. Like, you don't have to come in and be the man like you were in Jacksonville, Schobert. You can just come in and have fun and just play because we've got Cameron Hayward. We got two in front of you. We got two, we got an all world uh, outside linebacker next to you and a really athletic kid here on the inside with you, too, with Bush. Plus, we got Mika Fitzpatrick at your back, man. It's like, I think that these pickups were incredibly intelligent pickups for the Steelers because they understand that the talent is there and now having more talent within that defense allows their abilities to shine and move them around and to use them in different situations. And I think that that's really what's going to be special about this defense and something that I really wasn't expecting to see as much that we always know that there's going to be and defensive line rotation. There's going to be an outside linebacker rotation to an extent. It's going to be much heavier, I think, this year. But now we're seeing rotations in the secondary, which is something that we hadn't seen in the past. Well, yeah, I, I, you know, I agree with all that. Practically speaking, in the copycat league, you see, you know, by the way, we we still have not. I don't. It doesn't make me happy to say this. We haven't properly fully celebrated what Tom Brady did just because it's so weird. It's so anomalous. There's yeah. so it's so lacking in uh, any sort of historical comparison that we don't Switch, know what to do with it. What so switching conferences and winning another Super Bowl <laughs> in, for the bucket here. I know. Too. Like, it would have felt different if it was like the Rams or I don't know what, like a a mm. brand that you could respect as a yeah. foot, like the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in those uniforms, you went down there and the, 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 there's a pirate ship in the stadium and you want a <laughs> Super Bowl. Like that's weird. Yeah. I mean, right. but I maybe, maybe I'm, I'm jaded because associating mm. professional sports and pirates has not worked out in Pittsburgh, but anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think the, oh yeah, I, I'm with you specifically about, you know, you saw what there too. Um, inside linebackers did and their ability to cover right. and the way Tom right. to play it. Obviously yeah. you need those linebackers to be able to drop and run. Right. Um, so that's good. But the, to me, the bigger point is, is depth because mm -hmm. as we're learning and everybody weeps in various football towns, Oh, we're doomed because we've had injuries. You know who else has injuries? Every other team. Everybody. They, are, they are a constant. Now yep. I have the Jenga theory. That mm -hmm. is that if you take out the wrong piece Yes. The whole thing will implode. Obviously, she, that's true at quarterback. Yeah. Any you take away anybody starting quarterback, they're going to fail. And 2017, Ryan Chazier was that Jenga piece. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. That, I mean, the 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 human tragedy yeah. of that was was awful. Right. Um, you know, more severe than most injuries uh, goes out saying, but um, that also decimated what what the Steelers mm -hmm. were. I mean that, yeah. you know, for the, the equation of where they were at that point in that season, they, things play out differently. I, I suspect with number 50 in there. Um, but you know, I like the depth that they have now and, you know, mm -hmm. don't forget about Carl Joseph is, uh, is not right. Around. And Witherspoon and, was inactive. I mean, with <laughs> some extra pieces here to utilize there, they, they, they do have some sneaky depth now. And in part, right. again, back to Colbert yeah. or, and, or Roethlisberger, whoever you want to give credit to on that. I mm -hmm. mean, you do have, uh, he's not on a rookie deal, but for, you know, for all the knocks on seven in 2021, um, and look, I don't think he put up much of an argument about how well he moves or how well he doesn't move back there anymore, but <laughs> yeah. he is nevertheless, it's, it's an interesting philosophical kind of thing that I've been thinking about. And it's an huh. imperfect question, but yeah. people are very high on what Joe Burrow's going to do in the league. Yeah. Uh, Lamar Jackson already an MVP Baker <laughs> Mayfield QB and the best team in the history of the world or I don't know, something like that. <laughs> At all least it, 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 that's that's no, because they're not old enough to know. Uh, right. What was it? Uh, Graham. You know, it was the big championship winning quarterback yeah, yeah, yeah. Out there uh, for nine uh, years. Graham. That, yeah, nothing, Graham. Better with, nothing better than when Browns fans want to argue with me about Otto Graham. Like, <laughs> like, you, you didn't. If you didn't see Otto Graham play, how much are you really want to? How, how much are you going to fight me on it? Like right. really? Like you don't know what you're talking about if you don't know that Jim Brown's the best football player of all time. Like <laughs> if you're 78 years of age 
and yeah. you watch Jim Brown play multiple games and you saw with uh, with your jaw on the floor how dominant he was, by the yeah. way, against guys who basically had the physique of you and me. Yeah, and um, they were part-time players back then too. All they that were- stuff. If you're going to get up there and pound the table for that, have at it. I'm yeah. talk- I-, I-, I try to keep my focus in the Super Bowl era when football right. started to actually matter to Americans on a large scale. Right. Anywho. Um, yes, Otto Graham. Uh, I hail you. Terrific stuff, double zeros. What, right. what year was that? 1951? 50s, yeah. They own the uh, 50s. <laughs> good for, well, be proud. You, you, you always got that feather in your cap there, uh, Cleveland. But anyway, <laughs> right. Rob, so you have these guys who hmm. all three show great promise and have already delivered on that and have dominated here and there yeah. games, if not seasons. Hmm. Um, but at the end of the day, are you sure? that if all the rosters are close, that you don't like what a guy with Roethlisberger's pedigree that's going to drop him into the Hall of Fame five mm-hmm. years after he retires. Yeah. I I don't think that this is, that he is a detriment. I think of the two examples I keep putting up are, do I think you could ride with a quarterback who is as immobile as Roethlisberger and say like, yep, we're good with that for the next decade. We want that guy as our franchise QB for the next (laughs) five years. That's that's dicey in this era of football. But Peyton Manning was was the worst quarterback in the league in 2015. If you erase the name, he was the statistically the worst. He was outplayed by Brock Osweiler on his own team. They won the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. Last year, people say, there's no old quarterbacks just don't win the Super Bowl. Untrue. Mm -hmm. What happened last year? Yeah. Yeah. Brady was huge. Brady is is that the oldest quarterback to win a Super Bowl last year with Brady? Oh, or yeah. Is... I think by a lot. Okay. I think by a lot. I think I think Elway got his in at 38 or 39. Okay. Not, yeah. Not he's a well into his comp. 40s. Yeah. There's not a close comp for what he did. Because I, I think Warner was in his 40s when he played us. Was he really? I, I thought Warner he was close. Was in his 40s? I when thought he, he was in his 40s. No, he didn't start playing in the league for like five, six years. He was in the arena league and bouncing around a bit and oh, packing groceries. Best. And yeah, he's the, he's the best. I love yapping with him because he oh. has, he is, he is to me the, he personifies the what 21st century quarterbacks. He's not a swaggering guy like yeah. Marino or Elway, Kurt yeah. Warner isn't. But mm-hmm. if you ask him, and I have, I'm like, I, I asked him, I think it was four years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, if you decided to play NFL football, where do you think you rank among the quarterbacks? He's like about half, about 15. I'm about, probably about 15th in the league. I'm like, now you are? <laughs> this is the way. And then I love to talk to Derek Carr's brother, David, oh. about the same thing. He's the, he's the other side. Like Kurt Warner's <laughs> like, you got to be smart, yeah. you know, pre-snap, figure things out. David Carr is the other right. side of that. Like gunslinger, man. Give me, like, give me the big arm and we'll right. figure it out from there. <laughs> Both of those guys, I I love that I love all that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. um, and I and I love the ego that goes into it and everything. I think oh. Roethlisberger gets where he is, and he sees the example set by Peyton mm-hmm. and by Brady just last year. And Brady was great, and you know, yeah. all the credit. I mean, three road wins in the NFC, went into Lambeau and beat Rogers, right? And yeah. you know, beat Breeze yeah. in the Superdome. Oh, he didn't beat them. The team, yeah, I get it everybody. I yeah. understand. Quarterback He's a big is still, part of it. He didn't make quarterbacks mistake. the most yeah. important position. I think yeah. we can agree on that. Right. Yep. I like, I, you know, I think Roethlisberger gets where he is. I get the sense mm-hmm. that he gets what he's capable of doing and what he shouldn't be trying to do anymore. And that's a good place to start. I think he understands, boy, like I said, the diversity and weapons he has out there, if he can yeah. just get an extra beat before the pass rush gets to him, I think that this offense is not going to be the Kansas City Chiefs of 2018, but mm. I think it can be a, better than what most people assume it's going to be. And yeah. good, mm. keep, keep on sleeping on that offense. Go watch the Bills tape and say, see, they can't do anything. Yeah. Let that offensive line settle a little bit. Give him an extra beat, and then mm. I think the offense can can be at least competent and and, yeah. keep, and keep up against good, uh, good teams as the season goes on. So would you say Ben Roethlisberger, just from the the way that you're describing quarterbacks, to me it seemed like Ben Roethlisberger in his first until 2010 was that more of like that muchismo alpha quarterback, you know, it's all about me. It's it's more along that line. And from then on, 
it seemed like he became way more team oriented. Like I'm not saying even when he was more of had more bravado that he was going to throw his team under the bus. Cause I still don't remember any time where he'd lose a game in the playoffs and be like uh, manning against us when we beat him in, in his house in that, what was that? 2005. And I have to go, Oh, well, well, I didn't have any time, anybody blocking for me or I didn't have any time to throw Nothing the ball. Better. Nothing yeah, better. Right. Nothing never, better. What a you, saint, what a saint that right. Peyton was with his teammates. Yeah. Like what do we exactly. Think? The Never. inequity in response. Here, here's the yeah. best one. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but no, no, please. The one do. that's going on right now is. Oh yes, that's what I want to get to. The Ravens are the the Ravens are banged up. You know, mm-hmm. terrible stuff. I mean, for real. I'm not. I'm not trying to be a wise ass. I'm not like, hey, great. Uh, the 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 good players on the Ravens are all uh, are all really badly injured. I'm not gonna. And like Staley this. just came in today, right? Isn't he out now? Uh, yeah, their I mean, left tackle, R- Ronnie They're, Stanley's out yeah, now. Stanley, yeah, Stanley, definitely. Yes, thank you. Oh God. And, Wow. I mean, you know, as my point has been this whole offseason mm. is, as I say, I think the Steelers at the line of scrimmage are a little bit better than the Ravens all of a sudden. They're long yeah. in the tooth ball. Uh, Calais Campbell is dominant. Derek Wolf is is really yeah. good if underappreciated. But they're yeah. old guys now. They're like they're there's just not a lot of depth behind guys on the wrong side of 30 right. in Baltimore. And in the meantime, Lamar Jackson, it's not an insult to him. He is special. He will yeah. win them games by himself mm-hmm. when it doesn't make any sense by making plays that make no sense to, mm-hmm. to your eyeball or to um, pro, pro football defenders that he can do what he does. But that's going to be diminishing returns like, well, Lamar's mm-hmm. got to just save us in this. Like that just doesn't you, – you, one guy doesn't just keep winning games. There are very few guys that can cover the warts yeah. of, uh, of a – fraudulent roster i'm not saying that's where the ravens are just yeah. yet but there there's a very short list of like let's give that guy 40 million dollars and diminish what we can do with the rest of the roster because that guy's good enough that he'll be able to cover up whatever else uh is weak there are like four hmm. to six guys in the league in their primes who were or are able to do that i like lamar jackson a lot i don't think yeah. that's exactly right for him at least you better Give him a good offensive line because, as you can see, if you're if you're getting him from the edges like that, now you know now he's not able to. If you can't if he can't get out of the pocket and he's got to shoot up the gut, that's a that's a, he's at least going to take some shots in doing it. And yeah. you saw he fumbled yep. the ball yes more than yes. once on Monday well, he, Night Football, and that's not a fluke. I mean, if no. you're if his body is being exposed to like I didn't like what they what the Bills did with Josh Allen either. Yeah, the, it mean Josh, Yeah, Josh right. Allen, uh, uh, the the big pair. One of my favorite paradoxes, not favorite, <clears throat> but one that has endured through the through the ages is the that the biggest dudes are the ones who get the most beaten up by the end of it, and therefore wear out the most quickly. The power mm-hmm. backs, Earl Campbell, yeah. he was awesome for five years, and then he yeah. fell off a cliff. Shaq. Yeah. Eric Lindros, Mario Lemieux, Ben yep. Roethlisberger. You can't just Cam Newton. You can't just endlessly run the ball because if, if it Rob Gronkowski, Mark Bavaro, if it takes Jerome Bettis, well, right? Well, he was the anomaly. He, he, he was the anomaly. <laughs> he held up, but most yeah. guys don't, like you take right. that repeated beating year after year. You yeah. ain't gonna play as many years as yeah. the guys that are able to keep themselves nice and clean. Mm-hmm. Lamar Jackson never takes a direct shot. This premise is off now. If it continues to go this way, if he's yeah. actually having to run through guys, he's not built to do that. But Josh Allen shouldn't keep exposing his body to multiple <laughs> sizable human beings having yeah. to hit him in order to get him down on the ground. You and he was taking those that. direct shots on those quarterback designed runs. Yeah, you can see like he's coming up and he's taking a direct shot. He's not coming up in the hole and sliding. He's coming up in the hole. He's trying to put a shoulder down and you don't want that 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 billion dollar shoulder out there taking shots. But yeah, I mean, like I think that I think uh, you know, uh, I forget exactly where we were with Baltimore and what we're gonna do about uh, that team versus mm-hmm. uh, Roethlisberger versus Lamar and all of that. But I, I, I think you get. Oh, what I was gonna say is yes. Yeah. So Lamar now, offensive lines hurt. The running backs are all hurt. Um, the offensive line didn't look good going into the season, as far as I was concerned. Um, but now you hear like, poor Lamar, poor mm. Lamar. This is he deserves better. Exact same thing. Roethlisberger last year can't uh, can barely get the ball in his hands before he's uh, run over or has right. to get rid of it. Right. The same the same analysts who are now poor Lamar, and it is too bad for him. Yeah. <laughs> it's not not ideal for for him. Uh, but the same analyst a year ago, like Roethlisberger sucks. He's done. Look at look right. at him. He can't, he can't stand. He can't stand in there. We, we can't do it. Like, what? 
I, what, are you watching the same thing? Yeah, right. I mean, it's just, yeah, yeah. It, it sucks for any guy to have to stand yeah. back there and take a beating. Well, it, the game of football will always catch up with you on a long enough timeline. I think a lot of these analysts want to be right about Ben Roethlisberger's timeline. It seems like Alexander or Alejandro Villanueva's timeline is now, you know, it's starting to hit the wall there too. And I love the guy, love him as an army ranger, love him as a stealer. I live in the Baltimore area too. So I get to hear Baltimore local news as well as the national news, but Baltimore local news is way more pessimistic than the national news is trying to like say, Oh, woe is me. What was this? Uh, but it, you know, I understand how that goes, at least from a local perspective here, sitting in the Baltimore area. Oh, no, no, you'll never get the unvarnished truth more than by talking to the local fans. Right. So if you, yeah. People on the outside are like, oh, things seem all right. Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> And I've had the benefit of living both in the Philadelphia Eagles market for 13 years and in the Baltimore market for like 20 years. So. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> I hear some excellent, don't worry. Like my favorite thing to do as a Steeler fan is to listen to Baltimore local sports talk the day after a loss, especially after that big loss against the Raiders, which that game was insane at the end. I mean, boy, we are I mean, an all time weirdo. That, that, that overtime was an all time weirdo. The, that's the why that we watch the forward. game to see these moments that you just never would imagine. You wouldn't even write that down on a sheet of paper and put it into somebody in Hollywood. They're like, no way would that ever happen. That's stupid. It's like, no, we're going to come down to the, we're going to score a touchdown. They're going to say he's a foot short. We're going to be offside. They're going to move back five yards. Then we're going to throw it very in. Weird. That, I, I'll tell you that, that really was especially weird that the seller <laughs> celebration the hugging and everything else i mean right. i think yeah. I, I was watching the peyton and eli cast yeah and they were talking about like what if what what if they literally had uh, done a jersey swap go back out on the field in the other jersey i mean i don't know what they would have I really was yeah. like, like hey we know everybody on looking at tv like but it wasn't like we know and they're gonna yeah. overturn. it was like this is going on for like five minutes. I like yeah. tell them to stop doing that because this is going to get overturned. Yeah. What was everybody doing out there that I would have been, it would be really and hard to summon and they, the, they the said right, right away. I got and play again. Yeah. yeah or right. you knew it in, immediately. Yeah. As soon as you yeah. saw the replay, like 11 seconds after he was in the end zone, they're running the replay. Like, Oh, well he's short. And then for five yeah. more minutes, we're watching the rest of the nonsense. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but fortunately, too, due to the COVID rules, unless they change them, you're not allowed to do on-field jersey swaps currently. So that was oh, part man. of that. I'm against COVID. it anyway. Call me an old curmudgeon. <laughs> I don't like that. Do that in the bowels of the locker room. Learn something from WWE. We have we have been positioned ourselves. We've deluded yeah. ourselves as fans into be, it being us against everybody else. Yeah, come on, join us, players. On that, come on, meet us halfway. Pretend that you hate the team you're playing. Let's not pal around with them in in public view. Do that. Yeah. Go do that ugliness. Give your jersey up to whoever after the game, out of sight of we fans. We're not here for that stuff. Right. That's a that's that's a that's a you thing. That's not an us thing. Please cut that out. Yeah. And now, Dave, we're at the part of the show where we take some questions from Steeler Nation. We got a couple over here from the SteelerNation.com football forum. Slash Steel wants to know, will Loudermilk get a hat this week? Hmm. Because he was inactive last week. No, I, I, I don't get the sense. To their detriment or otherwise, the Steelers hmm. have not been in the age of free agency. Although I will say they've caught up a little bit with this. I uh, One of my... One of the most vexing things about their approach um, has been in the age of free agency. Like it takes till like year three or four in our system to really like what, what Dickie LeBeau wants to do. It takes a minute to figure it out. You can't really throw a guy out there as a rookie and everybody, like, right. you know, he's only here for four years, right? Like, I mean, we, we, we <laughs> yeah, get something out. Year you know. three till Timmons starts. <laughs> well, the worst, that's right. I mean, Timmons, yeah. Timmons legitimately was kind of like borderline bust until about, exactly. I mean, Lamar Woodley covered that up. You're like, okay, we got that yep. one right. But Timmons was the higher pick, but oh, right. that worked out. And then when it, Timmons got in, he was amazing. Yes. Absolutely then he amazing. was, yeah. then he was dynamite. Right. But yeah. it took a, it, it took a little bit. Hmm. I just think you got to create a system that is easy to plug a rookie into, or what are you doing yeah. In, yeah. in this era <clears throat> of football? That said, the Steelers don't love doing that, but he was also, when they took him, kind mm -hmm. of couched as a project. So I don't yeah. think he would be first up, second up, or maybe even third up to uh, to get a hat. Um, yeah. But yeah, if to it, I mean, Mark Cabali 
um, in his piece on the athletic last week said in his predict prediction, his season mm-hmm. predictions piece said that he predicts that, uh, two, it doesn't play till December, if at all this year. Wow. If, that, if that's true. Yeah. And if you're looking at the, what the players are saying, like, yeah, we all hope he's out there. There's n- certainly no assurance that he is going to make it out there anytime soon. So maybe louder milk as this, as the thing goes along, will uh, will start to play. I would be very surprised if in week two, they throw him out there. Yeah. I know Carlos Davis is a little banged up. He was limited this week a little bit. So if he wasn't going to play and he was going to be the inactive one, then that would be the only way I'd see louder milk coming in for this week. Uh, another question. Why didn't they call up Joseph is Norwood's play roadblock roadblocking that. Is um, so wait, nor, is, nor Trey Norwood is he stopping the ability for them to have you know Joseph come in already to contribute? Personally, I, I think it's because he's a uh, brand new to the team, he's got to learn just like Witherspoon's got to learn kind of what we're doing on defense before he gets to get on the field and play. Yeah, I might, the thing with Joseph that kind of <laughs> surprises me, and maybe I'll be proven wrong, and hopefully so. I think people are. Uh, expecting already too much from the minute that they signed yeah. him that like, yeah. well, you, you could put him anywhere. You put him in the slot, put him where like, wait, 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 all right, settle down. Everybody. He's not, he's not, he's not 22. <laughs> right. he, he's like, if he, yeah. if he contributes great, because we know what he can bring. He's a hammer. Yeah. Um, but you know, he's not, he's not the savior. There's a reason why the Steelers could go and get him when they did go and get him. But, mm-hmm. uh, but um, I, I, I suspect you're right that yeah. they're comfortable with who, went through camp with them versus a guy who they just signed in and didn't, there wasn't an essential need to put him in there in week one. And plus, who are you going to take off the field? Like Killebrew, who just got us six points on special teams. I liked his very, I, I, we we really talk about like, like, (laughs) I think I shall block this. (laughs) (laughs) He just put his wire. Usually it's like, ah, like that, like right all the way out. I shall block this straight off your toe, sir. I'm going to come around to the side. This Don't shouldn't worry, hurt a that. bit. It'll be over. <laughs> like that. Like, what a what a very like. Oh, that that thing. Oh yes, I shall swat it down. <laughs> there you are. Take oh, that. Take no, that, no, Ulysses, and make it into six. <laughs> it's my. Oh, I got to go pick it up. No, no, no. You have it first, Ulysses. I see you're closer to the football. You Thank enjoy. You. I've had my fun. Bip, bip, cheerio. <laughs> It's better than doing the French accents every time, like Pierre makes it play on the ball. Like the, the announcers are like, "Wee oh, wee!" All season we got to deal with it. <laughs> yeah, I know, uh, man. all season the French jokes, and then they oh. laugh. Oh, they laugh! So I know, hard. but they don't like. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna have a lot of that. <clears throat> so, what do the Steelers need to do on Sunday to leave Heinz Field with a victory? Um. I, lamest answer, but not get killed with big plays. You know, yeah. they do have between Waller, obviously getting, I think, what was it? 70, targets. 74 targets or oh, whatever. Oh, maybe <laughs> yeah, pretty, much. I pretty it, much. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously he's a, 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 a different special player. kind of guy than yeah. what you see out there against just, a, a you know, Kelsey or Kittle or otherwise it's what he's doing is different than what anybody else is doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know they have burners on the outside as well. Um, don't let Derek Carr throw it over your head. I mean the the the. Yeah. But the pat that's well, the thing with the Steelers secondary is, and I understand the concerns. Uh, but when you have that pass rush, it makes it practically difficult to uh, to do exactly that. You can't stand there for the extra beat and throw the deep ball. So right. you have to kind of chip away at the Steelers defense as long as, I mean, I know this is overly general to throw out, but to me, when the Steelers defense, the seasons when it really is a difference making unit and the Steelers are scary are a scary proposition heading into January is when they don't allow big plays. And there was, if you go through last season, it was very right. easy to focus in on what Roethlisberger wasn't doing and the line and the drops by the receivers and they can't run the ball and all of that, but the defense is so good and all the sack record and all that, mm-hmm. but they allowed big plays in yeah. bad spots. They couldn't yeah. put teams away. Yeah. Say Agreed. what you want. Steelers put the bills away. I know that they, you yeah, know, they did. if, if this is a team that can get up any points, if they can get mm-hmm. a lead that, you're not going to be able to just catch up 
in the blink of an eye on a play on them, which is dispiriting to the offense. It's re- really a scratching and clawing to get some points. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's what uh, what they need to do this week and going forward against the the Bungles. And then, you know, let, let's let, you know what? Let's get through the Raiders because I don't think the the Bungles are are a jive bunch rolling into town. I don't think it's like yeah. ah, it's a, <laughs> we'll take care. I mean, obviously, I think everybody remembers they beat yeah, they're, us last they're time getting we played them. Yeah, yeah, but they're but they're not they're not a punchline team. But no, um, I do think that that's generally speaking the approach for the Steelers' defense is limit big plays because our offense presumably is not going to be a high powered one too. So you have to play that nature of game. You got to try to play for the for the universal under until the offensive line is good enough that you can start trying to physically truck some teams and setting up all our playmakers on the outside. And, and I'm happy at least that the Ravens have shown us if you're going to be playing the Raiders, don't go cover zero. Don't go have a safety back there for God's sakes. It's the beauty of it. I mean, that's, that's, I, that's, I, where, I, that's where Carr was just running backwards and throwing it. And it looked a lot like shades of Tim Tebow in that, uh, in that playoff loss that we had, everybody wants, Oh, we lost to Tebow. It's like, yeah, if we didn't go cover, cover zero on that play, and he, one guy didn't beat this guy, then yeah, might everyone's, have been everyone's kind of figured it out now over the last, you know, whatever, 10 years or so hmm. is that the kryptonite for Dick LeBeau's defense. Well, it wasn't 10 years now. It was, I was, yeah. I was in the, I was in Heinz field in that awful night when the Steelers were, I guess that would have been January of hot five when the game kicked off at one degree against the Patriots in the AFC title game, Roethlisberger's rookie season. Yeah. And, you know, the kryptonite is to what LeBeau wanted to do is spread it out. Spread and, it out. And that's the end of that. Yep. Um, and they can't do anything. The, you know, people have identified now rightly that the Steelers can get to the QB with three or four guys. And, yep. you know, that is, um, you know, that's music to Tomlin and his, mm-hmm. you know, his back end there to be able to say we can drop. I mean, that, is what gives quarterbacks one if you can get after them a little bit but you know an extra player to cloud tom brady on downs line yeah. of sight and to cloud what he's looking at is is everything and so even if you don't love the individual pieces or at least there might be some dicey pieces on the back end this year i think mm-hmm. it could be made up for by pass rush and i don't think the steelers are going to try that and in fact i think the pressure is on the Raiders offensive line going into this one, not on the Steelers defense. And the last question we have here from Steeler nation comes from wig Josh Allen and the bills are obviously a potent passing offense and the defense really performed well against them at all levels. However, Carr has shown that he can be a very dynamic player in himself. Can the Steelers reproduce the kind of defensive performance they showed last week, or must the offense start producing more consistency sooner rather than later that the Steelers want to stay competitive? You, we, if you've been watch, if you if you watch football for twenty years, it's still. I I don't think we've mentally, spiritually, and otherwise fully accepted what we like. You know, the last pro football game uh, of week one in Vegas was representative of the fact that like you, you think like oh that team just took the lead. You you have to tell yourself. When there's 51 seconds left on the clock and a team goes ahead, you you you're used to like, oh, I can't believe they won the game with 51. Like, no, no, that's way too much time for any <laughs> NFL team. Any right. team that completes right. two passes and field goal and field kickers goal. can all make 60 yarders. Yeah, you, well, and you have Justin Tucker who makes 70 yarders. That guy. Right. So like, yeah. but but our brains haven't fully accepted that reality yet. Right. So the idea that like you know like yeah, last time we saw him, Derek Carr through two passes, maybe three. And it was like, oh, well, now they're in in the overtime. We thought the game was over. Instead, we're going to play another frame here. So my point being, points are relatively easy to come by. And Mm -hmm. 16 points from your offense is not going to win a ton of NFL games. So yeah, Yeah. the Steelers do eventually have to score more. But do they have Mm -hmm. to score as much as the Kansas City Chiefs offense does? No, because our Mm -hmm. defense is way better than what the Chiefs have. So yeah. Even in the context of what may be a really great defense over the course of the season. Yeah, the Steelers offense is going to have to become more productive. Yeah. But back to where we started way at the beginning of our conversation here. How impressive was that Bills win? More impressive, I think, than people are giving it. Uh, we can yeah. pick it apart. Uh, but block punt, like I said. But Josh Allen missed a throw no. early to Manny Sanders. And but like, 
Yeah. Sometimes the sometimes, you know, as they always say, we fans with our team, like our team is responsible for the win or loss. But there mm-hmm. are two teams playing and the Bills are just about everybody's one A in the AFC yeah. to go to the Super Bowl behind the Chiefs. In right. other words, they're really good. And that crowd was tuned up. And right. Very proud of the pass rush and all the new pieces that they have there. And we're ready to be different this year and stuff the run and get after the QB and the Steelers yeah. went in there and won. That was a real, real tough spot for yeah. a bunch of youngsters to go out there. And to your right. point, I'm with right. you a hundred percent. The first half was bleak. And I was like, mm. I, I really was fielding. I, I had to be the level headed one among yeah. the Steelers fans. It was like, Oh, this offense looks just as bad as they're like, can we take one minute? For this, and these are all, did <laughs> we not understand? Well, like this offense, yeah, yeah, of course the offensive line wasn't uh, right. But even by the second half, Roethlisberger was a little more comfortable, held the ball, tried to take a step, would slide up in the pocket, threw a couple of really nice balls in big spots. Yeah. I, you know, yeah, the, of course the Steelers offense has to get better if they're going to make the playoffs and be a, a threat to anybody. Yes, right. of course. But I think we have to give it a month, six weeks, and then we'll see. Dave, I could talk to you all day, man. <laughs> this is so easy. I know we just ate up about an hour of time for our podcast, and I appreciate all of the time that you have with us over here at Steeler Nation. But obviously, Steeler Nation, you got to check out Dave Damashek over here at Extra Points and Minus 3 Podcast. Follow him on Twitter at Damashek, D-A-M-E-S-H-E-K, and Instagram, D Damashek, D-D-A-M-E-S-H-E-K. Dave, a pleasure to be with you. Pleasure to be talking with you as always and having you on the show. I really appreciate your time and, and uh, of course, giving us a, let, letting us know what you already knew going on is that the Steelers are going to do what you already know because this podcast is about you. Well, thank you. I appreciate <laughs> you having me. The only thing that was unsatisfying about our conversation was you rubbing uh, my nose and the fact that you get to go to the game on Sunday and I don't. <laughs> Great. Hope you feel good about yourself. I do. I do. And I'll be spinning my towel for you. Don't worry. (laughs) Awesome. Steeler Nation, make sure you come on over to SteelerNation.com for all of your best articles, podcasts, vidcasts. We got an awesome forum over there. So come on over and get geared up. Steeler Nation at the gear page. Get some great t-shirts here for the Steeler Nation tailgates over at SteelerNation.com. You make sure to... Tweet us at Steeler Nation, Instagram us at Steeler Nation com. Follow the podcast on Twitter at underscore SN Podcast, or follow me at on Instagram and Twitter at SN Striker, spelled with a Y. Thank you for joining us for the Steeler Nation podcast, sponsored by Total Sports Enterprises on the DK Pittsburgh Sports Network. I'm your host, G Striker, along with Dave Damashak, rooting along with you as always. Go Steelers!